The topic of today's lecture is strong Korea with a question mark. But the thing that we need to understand is that America today is not the same America as America 50 years ago. And Chinese military spending actually increases from about 100 billion to nearly 400 billion dollars. I mean, why don't, why isn't the Korean defense estimate based upon, let's say, the Chinese military? The topic of today's lecture is strong Korea with a question mark. Because this is a question that we need to ask ourselves today. Is Korea strong? Certainly, Korea has become rich. But is it strong? 2010, March 26th, the Chananam frigate was sunk. 46 sailors were killed. 2010, November 23rd, Yongpyeongdo Island was bombarded. Two Marines and two civilians were killed. The Chinese response to the killing of Korean citizens and sailors was both North and South Korea should just calm down. They failed to differentiate between who the aggressor was and who the victim was. In effect, China told us here in South Korea, just be quiet. Of course, America, the longtime protector of Korea and our ally, condemned the attacks against our country. And they even sent three carrier groups to this region to stabilize the, the region. And as a result, most Koreans felt reassured. Korea was attacked, and like in the past, as America defended Korea, here America came again to stabilize the region and to defend Korea. But the thing that we need to understand is that America today is not the same America as America 50 years ago. Many things are changing and have been changing. One of the most fundamental problems that America faces today is its twin deficits. This chart produced by the U.S. Treasury shows last year America's fiscal deficit being greater than $1.5 trillion. This year America's fiscal deficit will be also about $1.5 trillion. Its trade deficit is, re is running at nearly $500 billion a year. The combined trade and fiscal deficits are nearly $2 trillion per year. That is two times the size of the Korean economy. And herein lies one of America's fundamental problems today. America does not have any money. And the question we need to ask as Koreans is, if America doesn't have money today, how is America going to guarantee the security of Korea? With what resources? This chart produced by the Congressional Budget Office shows America's 
public debt held from 1790 projected out to 2035. As of today, 2011, America's debt to GDP ratio is running at nearly 100%. And given the current state of America's laws, as shown by the light blue projection, America's debt to GDP ratio is expected to grow exponentially at an unsustainable rate. That means that if the American government does not have serious reforms to the current state of laws in America, America as a nation will collapse, much as like we are seeing Greece collapse today. It's just that simple. If you spend money you don't have, one day people are going to expect you to repay the money that you owe them. And when you can, you won't be able to buy anything. Now, even if America is able to come to some kind of budget compromise, that doesn't solve America's problem. Because given the very difficult state of politics in America, even a big deal to reduce the budget deficit and bring the budget to a more sustainable path will not fundamentally solve America's state of elevated level of national debt. It will merely slow down the growth or the further increase of debt. That's shown by the dark, dark blue dotted line below. So even in that scenario, America's debt would continue to grow, albeit at a slower rate. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, when America has so much national debt, we have to ask ourselves if America has the financial capability and the wherewithal to deal with another major crisis if one were to occur. For example, if there is another Korean War on this peninsula, will America have the money to deal with that conflict? This is the question we are forced to ask ourselves today. good way for you as individuals can, to understand this problem is you all have credit cards, right? Yes? What happens when you spend up to your credit limit? You can't use your credit card anymore, right? What happens then if you have a, a financial emergency? Then you're stuck, right? You have a very serious problem which you cannot deal with. It's the same for a country. And this is the fundamental problem we're facing today. If you look at this chart, this chart shows from 1969 to 2009 various regions' share of world GDP. On top, you can see the green line, which is Europe. Europe's share of world GDP has actually declined from 36% to 27% over the period. U.S. has roughly maintained its share of world GDP from 27% approximately. But the major story on this chart is basically the increase in Asia's share of world GDP, which has increased from 15% to nearly 26% as of today. But that story of the growth of Asia is not, you know, we're all part of Asia here, right, in Korea, right? So if Asia grows, then we think that this is great. Asia is as a whole benefiting, and so Korea must be doing super. But that's, exact, that's not precisely correct, because Asia is not just one country. It's actually composed of a number of countries. And in Asia, we know, we know the story of, let's say, like Japan during the last 20 years. Japan actually has pretty much stagnated. And for Korea, we know Korea's story as well. Korea during the last 15 years, actually we've seen that growth rate slow down quite a bit. So then what exactly, which nation is actually driving this growth of Asia's share of world GDP? This is actually the story of China, the growth of the Chinese economy. And 
since China is part of Asia, we might think that this is a great thing. China is growing. And economically, it's creating a great, it's becoming a great and prosperous nation. But the problem which we run into is that China, when we got attacked in Yongpyeongdo, basically told us to be quiet when our citizens were killed. And this is the issue of greatest concern, is that we are seeing, as of today, a fundamental shift in the balance of world economic power. World economic power is shifting from the traditionally wealthy countries, such as Europe and America, to China. And as of, to, as of today, in 2009, we've actually come to the point of inflection, where the Asian economies, Asia's share of world GDP, will permanently surpass Europe and America's share of world GDP. So we've come to a point of inflection, a point in time in which the relative balance of economic powers is shifting permanently from the West to the East. And the question which we have to ask ourselves as Koreans is this. Does this shift in the fundamental economic balance of power, is this entirely good for us? We have to ask ourselves the questions. Are there some dangers which we are not considering? This chart shows actually public opinion in the U.S. This, these two questions have been asked in the U.S. since 1964 to 2009. The first question asks whether or not America should help another foreign country if it gets into trouble. And the significant point is that for the first time since 1964, more Americans believe that America should not help a foreign country when it gets into trouble than believe should help. If you ask the question in a slightly different way, whether or not America should focus on America's problems or deal with the problems of other countries or other peoples, then overwhelmingly, the supermajority of Americans believe that America should deal with America's problems alone. Nearly 80%. And the trend is increasing in that direction. So the question that we, hear, we as Koreans have to ask ourselves is, we know what the American government tells our Korean government. Whenever they meet, they, America reassures Korea that America will always be here for us. That America will continue to honor its alliances and will continue to guarantee the security of Korea. But given the trends in American public opinion, we are forced to ask the question, for how long can the, un the government of the United States of America maintain a policy which is fundamentally unpopular with its people, especially since America is a democracy. This is the question we are forced to ask ourselves. You know, I had a chance to watch an interview in CNN by Piers Morgan of Donald Trump shortly after the attack on Young Pyongdo Island. And given America's very difficult financial situation, you know, Piers Morgan asked Donald Trump what he thought was America's problem because, you know, obviously Donald Trump is a very successful businessman and he knows quite a lot about money. So when he asked them that question, Donald Trump answered the question like this. He basically said, you know, the problem of America is Korea gets into trouble and America, we send our aircraft carriers to defend Korea for free. He goes on to talk about how America helped develop the Korean economy, 
how, Amer how Korea, America has continued to defend Korea. And his conclusion is, basically, the only thing that America gets from all this contribution to Korea is American jobs being taken away by Koreans. And, the, and in the past, you've heard Democrats in America say these kind of things quite often. But, you know, Donald Trump, he's a Republican. And that's the real difference in America today. Is that now in America, there's actually a consensus. Both Republicans and Democrats feel that America is shouldering too much of the burden of policing the world. And so in the future, American military expenditure will be cut. The only question is, how much? And so this is now the new reality which we face here in Korea and in the East. Will America be able to guarantee the security of Korea? Not only financially, but in terms of the political will of its people. This chart shows world GDP of various nations and military spending based on exchange rate conversions to US dollars. Now America is still the largest nation on earth with a $14 trillion GDP. And their military spending is about $741 billion. The $741 billion includes about $120 billion spent as extraordinary spending for the various wars that America is fighting. So the, its actual baseline spending is closer to 620 billion. China is now actually the second largest nation on earth in terms of GDP, with nearly six trillion dollars of GDP and a hundred billion dollars of defense spending. And on this list we can see Japan and various other countries. Now when when people take a look at this chart, there are many people who say that, okay, China's military spending has grown a lot, but look, China's military spending is only 100 billion and America's is still approximately 600 billion. America spends six times more than China. What exactly do we have to worry about right now? Isn't it gonna be decades before China's military power becomes anywhere near the military power of the US? But there are two fundamental problems with that argument. The first problem with that argument is that US military spending is actually dispersed throughout the world. They have commitments in Europe, in the Middle East, they have commitments in Africa, in US at home, and in Asia. Whereas Chinese military spending is concentrated 100% here in Asia. The second problem with this comparison is that it's based on exchange rate conversions to US dollars. And the problem with that method is that when you're comparing countries of differing GNP per capita, a wealthy nation versus a you know, relatively poor nation if you're looking at the amount of money each individual has. The problem is that a relatively low GDP per capita nation has substantially lower commodity prices than a fully advanced economy like the US. And the best way to understand that is the cost of maintaining, let's say, one soldier in America versus China. Because commodity prices are so much lower in China, it only costs a fraction of the cost of maintaining one soldier in China as it does in the US. 
And in order to deal with, so in order to deal with this problem of comparison, comparing nations with different levels of GNP per capita, the USCIA has actually developed a, an alternative method called the Purchasing Power Parity Index. And this index actually adjusts for the differences in commodity prices. So if you take that index and reapply them to these numbers, the figures look substantially different. On a purchasing power parity basis, America, because it is the baseline, it stays the same at $14 trillion GDP and 741 defense spending. But look what happens to China. China's GDP actually increases from about $6 trillion to $9 trillion. And Chinese military spending actually increases from about $100 billion to nearly $400 billion. That's already approximately 60% of U.S. military spending as of today. And so the problem what we're, that we're seeing today is not only that there's an economic shift in the balance of power from the West to China, we are also starting to see a shift in the military balance of power from the West and America to China. And maybe if China was a democracy, yeah, we might not be so concerned. But remember, China basically told us, told Korea, told Koreans that when our people die, it yeah, doesn't matter, just be quiet. And here we can see China's exponential growth in defense spending. Actually, China announced again this year that they would increase defense spending by nearly 12%. If they maintain a 12% increase in defense spending for five years, then the Chinese military expenditure will double again. So the main point which I'm making here is that if you convert these figures to purchasing power parity, then within five years, on a purchasing power parity basis, Chinese defense spending may exceed that of the U.S., given that American, American defense expenditures are expected to be cut. And this is a very serious change in the world order. largest standing army and is experiencing a surge in military hardware and technology. National security correspondent Jennifer Griffin reports on reaction here at home and in one place of mutual U.S.-Chinese interest. Taiwan's test of 19 missiles today may have been an attempt to embarrass China's president as he arrived in Washington. The problem is one-third of the missiles failed. There was near symmetry except the Chinese military's surprise test of a J-20 stealth fighter prototype did not fail when Defense Secretary Robert Gates visited Beijing last week. The civilian leadership uh, seemed uh, surprised by the test and assured me that it had nothing to do uh, with my visit. Current and former U.S. Air Force commanders say the J-20 looks a lot like Lockheed Martin's FB-22. A coincidence? Every day there are more than 1,000 attempts to break into the Pentagon's classified computers, most of them emanating from China. You'd have to be living under a rock not to assume that uh, they've been actively uh, seeking uh, information uh, from uh, companies as well as uh, the Department of Defense in a variety of different ways. What continues to baffle Pentagon officials is China's galloping defense budget, up 464 percent in the past 20 years. Compare that to U.S. defense expenditure, which has grown by 31 percent during the same period and is now facing cuts. China has a new mobile land-based ballistic missile that can sink an aircraft carrier known as a carrier killer. It has added 30 submarines to its fleet in the past decade, while the U.S. has only commissioned one new sub. 
What this should be is a wake-up call for the strategic complacency of those who believe that the U.S. will continue to maintain air and naval dominance uh, in the Pacific. And now General Electric will voluntarily share with the Chinese the technology behind its state-of-the-art jet engines as it seeks contracts in China's booming commercial aviation market, potentially giving China the ability to surpass Boeing and Airbus. At the Pentagon, Jennifer Griffin, Fox News. This is a picture of China's new aircraft carrier. It successfully completed its sea trials. I don't know, you can call me stupid, but uh, that doesn't look like a defensive weapon to me. I've been working here now in Korea since 2005, and as the chairman of the Tong Il Foundation, I've had an opportunity to meet many of our leaders, both on the civilian and the military side. And one of the very interesting things which I learned here in Korea, talking to a number of generals, I was very surprised to, to learn that most of our military planning and our estimate about what we need to buy in terms of military hardware for, to provide for our national defense is primarily based upon the North Korean military strength or capability. And, you know, for many people in Korea, we might think, yeah, that's reasonable. North Korea is a country which invaded Korea in the past, and, you know, they're the military which is right across our border. That's, that's what we should be preparing for, right? But I found that very strange and actually quite alarming. Because, actually, North Korea in this region is actually the weakest military. I mean, why, don't, why isn't the Korean defense estimate based upon, let's say, the Chinese military? Why aren't we making our defense estimate based on Russia's military? Russia recently announced $600 billion of defense modernization. What about the Japanese military? Japan conquered Korea and colonized it. Why is Korea's defense estimate based upon the weakest military in this region, North Korea? This is what I don't understand. Okay, given that, let's say, we accept the fact that our defense estimate is based upon the North Korean military. So I asked one of our very senior generals this question. If Korea, North and South Korea get into a war, will we win? And his answer was, yes, 110% South Korea will win if it gets into a war with North Korea. But then he puts a condition on the end. He says, if it's a conventional war. But then I ask him the question, wait, North Korea has what you call asymmetric weapons, or non-conventional weapons, like nuclear weapons, and chemical weapons, and biological weapons, and they now actually have the delivery systems to deliver those weapons with. They have short-range and mid-range missiles. And by the way, they developed the nuclear weapons and the mid-range missiles during the last 15 years, while everybody was so busy talking about peace. So I asked him, what happens if they use these unconventional weapons? Will South Korea still win? Then his answer changes. He says, South Korea could win, but it could also lose. This is the problem. Is this what we call national security? We can't even be sure that we can defeat the weakest military in the region? I mean, if we can't deal with the weakest military in the region, what does that mean if other militaries get involved in a conflict? Let's say like China. 
what will happen to Korea then? It's kind of obvious, right? Without America's help, we're going to be defeated. And this is the fundamental problem. We are not able to defend ourselves. Our national security is not secured by our own military. It is contingent. It is almost entirely based on the American military power. And this is the problem. American military power at this point, given America's situation, we have to seriously question whether or not that power will be here to maintain peace in the region. And although many people like to disparage the North Korean military as being kind of backwards or not having very good military equipment, they did you know, purchase 40 SU-25 Russian fighters, which are pretty good. And you know, you've seen the pictures of the bombing of Yongpyongdo Island, right? When North Korea bombarded the island, they hit pretty much what they were aiming at. That's why we lost Korean lives. But what, happens, what happened when we returned fire against the North Korean artillery? What did we hit? You know, there were some satellite images produced of where our artillery returned fire hit, and basically we just managed to destroy a few grains of rice. We didn't hit anything. And I asked one of the, our senior generals this question. You know, I've been told that North Korea has a very backward military. But in the Yongpyongdo Island incident, the photographs of the satellite photographs of where our artillery hit were just basically rice fields. What happened? And at first, the general, he got very defensive and he first said, well, the news media should have never printed those pictures. But then after that, then he says, basically, well, they, they must, North Koreans must have used electronic jamming. That's why we didn't hit anything. But the problem with that explanation is if North Korean military can use electronic jamming, maybe they're not all that backwards after all. So the explanation given to us by our government really doesn't make that much sense. <laughs> Okay, this video shows the history of this region for the last 2,000 years. You can see the timeline on the lower right-hand corner. Every time the map changes, this is going to be war, civil war, revolution, revolt. Look what happens to the country of Korea. So what do you think? We've had a very peaceful history? No? Yes? Maybe? Yeah, that's the problem. This region has been very... 
There's been a lot of wars in this region, and Korea's actually been invaded quite frequently. I mean, if you think about Korea, it's being invaded a thousand times in the last 5,000 years of history. That's about a war every five years. We all know why we had peace dur during the last 60 years, right? It's called American military power. That's why Korea has had peace. But when you look at this video and this, the video, then where does most of the attacks come from? Who attacks Korea the most? Most of the attacks come from China or the Chinese region. Probably 80% of it. When's the last time that Korea was invaded by China? The Korean War, right? During the Korean War, actually, when North Korea invaded South Korea, General MacArthur actually defeated the North Korean army. He actually reunited the Korean Peninsula. He actually, the U.S. troops went up to the Yalu River. But then what happened? There was a Chinese invasion of North Korea which actually redivided the country. Chinese troops stormed across the border and they kept on coming, human wave after human wave. And American forces were forced back down to the 38th parallel. And that is why Korea is divided today. And it is still Chinese power which sustains North Korea and keeps Korea divided. America did its best to try to reunite the country. But because of China's invasion, it was not able to keep it united. So this is the situation which we're left with today. Given that the region is so unstable, given that there has been so much war and conflict, and given that it was American power that maintained peace in this region, what can we do to maintain peace in this region if and when American power can retreat from the region. This is the question that we're left with. Because whether America stays in Korea or not, that's going to be up to the American people. But whether America stays or goes, we're still going to be here in Korea. The Korean people will still be here. And so the question is for, for us, the nation of Korea. What kind of future do we want to have? Are we satisfied in returning to the historical norm, which is basically that China takes over Korea, and we become a vassal state? Is that the fate of Korea? Or does our independence and our democracy mean something to us? Does this have significance? Is this worth preserving? And then the question we need to ask ourselves is, if democracy and freedom is important, what are we willing to do to preserve our freedom and democracy? That's the question which we as Koreans, we need to ask ourselves. You know, there are many people in Korea who think that because Korea is such a small country and China is such a large country, that really in the, in the long run, there's nothing that Korea can do about China if China wants to take over Korea. So there's many people who understand the problem, but then are kind of resigned to the eventuality that there's no way we can deal with China if China wants to take us over. But that kind of thinking, in my opinion, 
It's not so imaginative. If we really are interested in preserving our freedom, interested in preserving the independence of the Korean nation, we can actually look around the world and we can find some very specific and very clear examples of very small countries which are actually quite par powerful. And one of the best examples of a very small but powerful country is actually Israel. It is a very small country with only 7.3 million people and only $217 billion of GDP. Our GDP here in Korea is nearly $1 trillion. Israel's defense budget is only $16.2 billion. That's approximately just half of the defense budget of Korea. Israel is outnumbered 500 to 1 by the surrounding Arab countries. But you can hardly call Israel weak. Look at Israel's capabilities. Israel is actually able to field 19 combat divisions during times of war. They are able to rough, roughly mobilize one half of their entire country if a war is to arise. Four million men and women at arms. The Israeli Air Force could fly, can fly nearly 3,000 sorties a day. During the Gulf War, the U.S. Air Force only flew 1,600 sorties a day. Both qualitatively and quantitatively, the Israeli military is more powerful than all the other surrounding militaries combined. Israel is a small but strong country. And because they're small and strong, they're actually able to defend themselves. They don't have to rely 100% on America to defend them. And because Israel is able to defend themselves, they are the masters of their own fate and their own destiny. And they preserve their own nation and their democracy. And you know, everybody knows that Israel is not supposed to have nuclear weapons, right? But then everybody knows that, that Israel does. Israel is a small but strong country. You know, for generations and generations, our ancestors actually have passed down very good wisdom to us. They've always told us that basically, if we want peace, that we must prepare for war. Because in reality, if you look at human history and you look at even the history of this region, the countries which gain peace are not the countries that are weak. That's the great irony of history. Those who are weak and just dream of peace actually see war. They get conquered. If you look at history and look at the countries who are able to maintain peace, they have peace because they are strong. We had peace in Asia, in this region, for 60 years because of American military power. But now that military power, since it is retreating from this region, needs to be replaced by something. And the question is, if we don't take responsibility to preserve our freedom and our nation, who will do it for us? Therein lies the problem. Nobody will. And if nobody protects and preserves us, then we will be probably absorbed into China, most likely. My hope for Korea is that this country can remain 
as an independent nation, as a strong nation, with its own identity and its own culture. And that our fellow Koreans can realize that that has a great deal of value and that that is important and that our independence, our freedom and our heritage is something worth passing down to future Koreans, to the next generation and the next generation to come. So my hope is that this country chooses peace in this region through strength and that we preserve our identity as an independent and strong Korea. Thank you very much.